With the basic nuggets defining what Scrum is behind us, the next series of nuggets is going to talk about the larger application of Scrum in your organization. And this nugget is going to focus specifically on delivering large projects with Scrum. To date in this series, we've discussed Scrum in the viewpoint of having a single Scrum team, a single product owner, and a single product backlog working on a project of a manageable size that obviously can be delivered with a single team. And that is, I think, the best way to deliver and appreciate the principles of Scrum. But I think reality is most projects are large enough in business today that a single team of seven ish people certainly aren't going to be able to deliver all of the functionality required by the business in a, a reasonable time frame so therefore we will need to have a process for delivering larger projects with scrum and the answer is yes scrum scales very easily scrum scales very well and in this nugget we're going to focus specifically on the scaling of scrum and we're going to focus on how do we scrum the scrum how do we scale the team realizing that we are going to need 20 to 25 people to deliver the business functionality in the required time frame, how do we scale the team? If the project is getting large, how do we scale the product owner? We expect the product owner to be available 50% of the time to a single scrum team. If we come up with multiple scrum teams, how are we going to scale the product owner to support all of that? And how are we going to scale the product backlog? This bulletin board of all of the stories. If we've got a large project with a large team, how do we keep the product backlog corkboard itself manageable? And we'll introduce this concept of a scrum of scrums, probably a, a concept or a principle of scrum you've heard of already, where you have your daily scrums for each team, and then you have a scrum where the teams combine. And we'll discuss how scrums of scrums work. And finally, as we get into the delivery of large projects, we'll talk about some specific issues around synchronizing the sprints and the releases to ensure that our larger teams are working in a co coordinated and cohesive manner. But first, scaling the team. Scaling the team recognizes that the average good scrum team as I said, is in the seven person range. It can be a little smaller, it can be a little larger, but we've, as we've discussed already, the average well-sized scrum team is gonna be more or less in the seven range. If we have a large project to deliver, we need more people. As we said in the introduction, let's assume we need 20 to 25 people working on the overall delivery to get the business results delivered in a meaningful time frame. So we're obviously going to have multiple scrum teams. If we continue this scenario, we're probably going to have four teams of you know six each, six to seven people per team to come up with the expected complement for the project of 20 to 25. So how do you size, how do you distribute, how do you put your teams together? Do you say this team, team one, is focused on inventory, team two is focused on finance, team three is focused on et cetera, et cetera. And often people will do that to develop co cohesive teams. But if you think back to some of the scrum principles we've talked about already with there is no code ownership, there absolutely has to be willingness for anyone to pick up anybody else's piece of code. The concept is saying one team is focused on this specific business area and another team is focused on this specific business area is not really very scrum like. So do you put together a team that has skills? This team does all of the work in C++. This team does all of the work in Java. Yeah, that probably makes sense because obviously the skills need to be complementary so that the teams can work cohesively. But the short and long of it is there is no firm 
recommended way to distribute your, your team members across the teams. Probably the only recommendation I would have is have some Scrum expertise in each team and have some Scrum newbies. Assuming you have newbies, if you have absolutely fully experienced in Scrum, then you don't have the same issue. But obviously, you want to have some leaders, some coaches, some mentors across all of the teams so that the newbies are going to get brought up appropriately. But again, bottom line is how you distribute your team members across the teams is going to be really based on developing the best cohesive teams you think. And then I'm going to throw all that away and I'm going to say, and we need to share team members frequently. So if we have Betty working on team number one after a period of time, four to six weeks, i.e. two to three scrums, sprints rather, maybe Betty should go and join team number two and Fred could either replace Betty directly on team number one or Fred could move down to team number three and you're going to get some cross pollination, some skills transfer. And that's absolutely consistent with our Scrum principles of no single point of ownership and it is team ownership. We want to share the team members frequently so that we don't develop into silos, that we are all working towards the same completion of the same product backlog. So the same concept of self-managed, self-organized Scrum teams, we want to have the same concept of self-managed, self-organizing scrum team combinations and I think again the best way to keep the teams working as a cohesive unit is to share the team members frequently. Another key concept of that is go to each other's daily scrums. So again not necessarily the scrum master but often the scrum master and we'll really discuss this principle in just a few minutes when we dis discuss the Scrum of Scrums concept, but have appropriate team members go to the other team's daily scrums so that again, we can be appreciative of, of the challenges and successes they're having working on their stories from the product backlog, and we can ensure that we're all working towards the same common goals. And as much as Steve really likes to use paper and cork boards for managing his scrum projects. When you're getting into larger teams, I will say often automated tools will facilitate dealing with multiple scrum teams more effectively, dealing with the complexity of the larger product backlog, dealing with some of the other complexities of dealing with multiple scrum teams. I will admit I still love my cork boards and I still love my manually drawn um, radiators showing my, my progress. Automated tools will certainly help scale the team a little bit. I don't have any one specific tool that I'm going to recommend to you. There are some really good automated tools out there in the scrum area based on the way your team works, based on the specific agile principles that your team has implemented simply go out and find the team or find the tools that's going to work with the team environment that, that you have in place in your organization. A lot of organizations working with larger teams will have a dedicated cross-functional team. So what do we mean by that? We have team one, two, and three, and let's say we have a cross-functional team of team number four. The cross-functional team is focused on the stories, the interfaces, the bridges, if we can use that term, across the teams. So team number one is working on stories one, five, and 15. Story number two is working on stories two, 18, and 36, and so on. And story number 42 needs information from story number five as input. And story 42 is going to produce the output 
that story number 36 is going to do. So recognizing that this story needs to have understanding of what's going on in story number five and needs to have understanding of what's going on in story number 36. Often these focused, dedicated cross-functional teams will be put in place that deal with all of those stories that will cross team boundaries to ensure, again, that we have a cohesive final deliverable that's going to commit to the product. And a final statement buried down here with all my handwriting, hen scratching if you want to call it that way, is where possible, co-locate your scrum teams. So not just having your seven people working together, have your 20 to 25 people working together. And you may instantly say, holy chaos. How can I have 25 people crammed into a large common work area, no dividers, common workspace? Try it. It will work. Or if it doesn't work, put up some dividers. Keep them all in the same general area and put up a couple of standard office dividers between the teams. But make it easy for your teams to go out and talk to each other. So scaling Scrum, scaling the team, really not a problem. A little bit of an ingenuity, a little bit of commitment, and it's quite easy to scale your seven-person ideal team up to 20 to 25, up to literally hundreds or even thousands. A little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of dedication, and it can absolutely work. Unfortunately, our next aspect of scaling Scrum, which is scaling the product owner, isn't as easy as scaling the team. I hope I have believe, made believers of you that the scaling the team is pretty easy. I have to say scaling the product owner is far more challenging, but it's absolutely critical that we have some concept of how we're going to scale the product owner for large projects. As I said in my introduction, if we have one team of seven, we want 50% of the product owner's time. If we have four teams of seven, does that mean we need 200% of time from the product owner? The answer is basically yes. If we have four teams, we really need 200% of our product owner, which means we need to scale the product owner because I don't think there's many product owners out there in the world that want to dedicate 200% of themselves to the project. It's going to sort of contradict or, or work against the, the effective work private life balance that we all want. So we need to scale the product owner. And we need to recognize that the product owner is far more than just a SME. Simply scaling the product owner saying, well, the product owner, there's still a single product owner and the product owner is just going to have more SMEs. SMEs and SMEs and SMEs and SMEs. And the product owner is going to constantly refer the team to the SMEs for the stories. And that's a large part of scaling the product owner is we need to have this very, very good stable of SMEs out there so that the SMEs can work with the team to understand, to flesh out, to, to define the stories. But scaling the product owner is more than the SMEs. The product owner has the vision. The product owner represents the business owner. And that's where scaling the product owner becomes a challenge. So each one of these four teams needs to interact with the product owner to understand how the story supports the vision, to understand how we're going to satisfy the business owner's requirements with the completion of each story. Yes, we can absolutely go to the SMEs to get the details. We don't need to bother the product owner for all of that, but the product owner has to have the vision. The product owner has to present the, the business owner's needs to the team. So if we're dealing with only four teams, it's not unlikely that the product owner can represent the vision to the four teams with the effective application of SMEs to do the detailed work on the stories. But as soon as our number of teams grows much higher than four, let's say we had 12 teams, 
I don't believe even if the product owner is only representing the vision, the business owner to the teams that a single product owner has the, the, the daily capacity, enough hours in the day to support the product vision to the team of 12, which means again, we need to scale the product owner. We need to get multiple product owners. And as I say, that's a challenge. How do you share the vision? How do you ensure each of the product owners represents the vision correctly? And my only answer to that is we need to clearly define that product owner one is responsible for part of the vision. And product owner two is responsible for second part of the vision. Or product owner three um, is the spokesperson for the business owner. And on and on and on. As we begin to scale the product owners, we need to truly understand exactly what the roles and responsibilities of the of the individual product owners are going to be so that our teams know exactly who to, to talk to. And the last comment I'm gonna make on scaling the product owner is, the product owners scale very differently than the teams. As I said, with a little bit of ingenuity, I think we can easily still have a single product owner for, for a, a scrum project that has four teams in it. But as soon as we get much larger than that, we need to have some scaling of the product owner. So there's no such, it's not a one-to-one. -one. If I have two teams, I need two product owners. And if I have three teams, I have, need to have three product owners. And it's not always a four to one ratio. It's going to be based on the individual needs of the teams and the individual needs and expectations and knowledge and interaction of the product owners. I have to finish this part of this series on scaling the product owner with, I don't have a magic answer for you. I can't tell you exactly how to scale the product owner. It is, in my humble opinion, the most challenging aspect of scaling Scrum. And all you can look for is a method that works. Be prepared to try and improve and change. Change the roles and responsibilities. Change the interaction between the product owners and the SMEs. Change the number of product owners that you have and how they interact with the team, but be prepared to scale the product owner. So with the complexity of scaling the product owner behind us, I'm going to move to probably the most simplistic aspect of scaling Scrum, which is scaling the product backlog. And the short answer is, it doesn't scale. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. There is one and only one product backlog. And the reason there can only be one and only one product backlog is there's no way to try to separate the story. So if we have our product backlog here and we have story number one, business unit number one cares about story number one, but so does business unit number two. And business unit number two cares about story number two, as does both business unit number two and business unit number three. So because of the interactions of the business units, because we're going to have the same thing, team one, team two, team three, selecting stories. So team one may select story number one for their next sprint and team two, and I'm making this far too linear, but team three is gonna pick story number three. There has to be commonality of what the business is expecting, and there has to be commonality of what the teams are going to select their sprints from. And the only way we do that is by having one and only one product backlog. So product backlog doesn't scale. There is a product backlog. If there's a team of one, or sorry, one team, we have one product backlog. If we have 45 teams, we have one product backlog. But if we have a large number of teams, 
if we have 45 teams, managing the product backlog is going to be horrendous because if we have 45 teams, we have a very large project, which is going to mean hundreds to thousands of stories. And if we had a single product backlog flip chart, or not flip chart, corkboard, that had hundreds to thousands of stories on it, it's going to be unmanageable. So in order to support a scaling of Scrum in the viewpoint of the product backlog, epics are critical. We've talked about how epics are critical to managing the complexity of the product backlog anyway. Epics become far more critical for managing the product backlog for large projects for scaling Scrum. And again, as much as I hate to say it, automated tools are very, very effective for managing large product backlogs for large projects. And as much as I hate to say it, automated tools for managing stories is probably the only way to truly go when you have large projects with many, many stories. But even with automated tools, we need to keep it manageable. You know, the, the common management scenarios are a single person can manage seven to 10 people. Other studies have shown that when people are presented with more than 100 to 150 different units, they are no longer able to visually, mentally process, to understand, to comprehend. So if you literally had a product backlog with 500 stories, so instead of having a nice little cork board, you have an entire wall in your, your project workspace that has 500 stories on it. When the product owner, when the business owner, when anybody comes down and looks at that product backlog of 500 stories, it's just on comprehensible uh, and, and I don't know that that's the right word but it's just they, they cannot process it they cannot put value to it they can read individual stories and say yep that story makes sense and yes that story makes sense but when they try to put it all together the, the mind cannot process that much information so again no matter how you're doing it using epics using automated tools keep it down to a manageable size so that it can be processed by the mere human brain and keep it down to 150 but expect it to grow as you remove so it's going to grow with new stories for future sprints as you remove stories for existing sprints but the backlog is the backlog is the backlog as i say there's one and only one product backlog no matter how large your scrum engagement is going to be. A very common concept when we scale Scrum for larger projects is we develop this concept of a Scrum of Scrums. So each team has their daily Scrum following all of the principles we've already described for the daily Scrum and then one team member, typically the Scrum Master, attends a scrum of scrums. And by doing the scrum of scrums, the four teams, one, two, three, and four, are all represented, and their problems, their successes, their issues are represented, and the representatives, again, typically the scrum master, can go back to the team, either directly if it's urgent, or go back to the team in the team's next daily scrum and present that team number three tried this approach for code management and they think it's a good idea. Or team number four is having a challenge getting something to compile fast enough, or we believe the daily build server is reaching capacity or whatever they get from the scrum of scrums, and they take it back and they share it with the individual teams. So it's just, the way we scale Scrum while maintaining the principles of Scrum. As I said, typically the Scrum masters are the people who, obtain, who attend the Scrum of Scrums, not critical. And the Scrum masters may bring along a key resource. If this 
Scrum of Scrums is going to be discussing technical issues, they may bring across the team member who's most involved with technology, or if the Scrum of Scrum is going to be discussing database concerns, they may bring across the, the person who does the most of the work in the databases, or if it's going to be a Scrum of Scrum on testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we will typically develop our Scrum of Scrums. The Scrum Masters are the people who attend the cross-pollination, and the product owner although always encouraged, is not critical. The details will be discussed in the daily scrums. We want the product owner at that. The scrum of scrums is more for the cross-pollination and cross-information sharing. So therefore, I would love if my product owner had the time to come to my scrum of scrums as well, but it's not critical that the product owner participates in the scrum of scrums. And I don't believe it's critical that the Scrum of Scrums is daily. It certainly needs to be more frequently than weekly. It could be every two days or maybe three times a week. So Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, or maybe just Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, but again, I don't think a Scrum of Scrum should be delayed as, as infrequently or scheduled as infrequently as weekly, but does not have to be daily. And we're not going to adhere to the same degree of rigor in our Scrum of Scrums. It does not have to be fixed to 15 minutes. Ideally, it would be nice if our Scrum of Scrums can start and finish in the 15 minute window so our Scrum Masters can go back to their teams and complete their daily jobs on the teams. But recognizing there may be issues, there may be cross knowledge sharing that the Scrum Masters need to do in the Scrum of Scrums that is critical to overall success, to manage the interdependencies and the inner workings of all of the teams. So we don't want to limit it to 15 minutes, but it absolutely follows the same approach. What's going on? What did I work on since the last Scrum of Scrums? What is my team working on be for the, before the next Scrum of Scrums? And what are the problems? What are the issues? What are the warnings? And this concept of Scrum of Scrum scales. So you can have a Scrum of Scrums of Scrums of Scrums. You can scale this up. So again, you can have your 45 teams. You're going to bring together maybe five Scrums of Scrums. And then a single Scrum of Scrums of Scrums. So that again, we get the same cross sharing, we get the same knowledge sharing throughout our fully scaled Scrum engagement. And a final principle that I want to leave you with in this nugget is as we scale Scrum and we have multiple teams working on sprints, how do we keep everything synchronized? Well, as far as sprints goes, I don't think we need to synchronize sprints. We don't have to have every sprint finishing on the same day of the week on a Wednesday, nor do we even need to have all sprints of the same length. Team one may find they may work most effectively in a two week sprint. And team number two may find that they like a four week sprint. And team number three, being the oddballs and liking the, 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 the number three, like to work in three week sprints. Once a team establishes their sprint length, the same thing should apply that we've talked about already. Team one should stick with a two week sprint for as long as it continues to work. It shouldn't be changed willy nilly. And the same thing, team number two should continue to work in four week sprints until they have solid evidence of why it needs to be changed. But we don't want to bind our individual teams to being in lockstep. As a matter of fact, there's lots of good reasons why we don't want all sprints finishing ex at the same time. And that's because it's virtually impossible for the product owner the scrums of scrums concept to plan multiple sprints concurrently. So if we had four teams all finishing on a Wednesday, 
That means we have four teams going into the sprint retrospective and the sprint plan concurrently and therefore the product owner and any other oversight would be absolutely stretched beyond capacity to participate in four sprint planning sessions literally simultaneously. So there's lots of good reasons for the sprints to be at a step. Maybe we want to have team one finishing on Mondays, team two finishing on Wednesdays, team three finishing on Fridays, and so on to allow our sprints to spread, to distribute the effort, the focus of the sprint retrospectives and the sprint plans appropriately to manage the workload on our product owners, on our cross-functional teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but having said that, I would suggest releases should be aligned. We don't want team one saying, I'm going to release every two months and team two saying we're going to release every one month and team three saying we're not going to release until four months. Because as soon as all of these releases get out of step, the business is going to get very confused and the business is going to get overwhelmed with the amount of effort, the amount of turmoil, the amount of upheaval that comes from dealing with multiple releases from each of the scrum teams. So again, let your sprints get out of step, out of synchronization, but pull them back together. In three months, at the end of June, we want to focus on having a release. So, team one, if you're working on two-week sprints, when do you think you would be ready for a release in June? Team number two, team number three, and yes, it may not be ever possible if you've truly got this wide a range in the lengths of your sprints to ever absolutely perfectly align. So let's say team number one with the short sprints are ready first, but team number two and team number three need one more week to finish their sprint, that's fine. Find some valuable work for team number one to do. Some of this release preparation work, the documentation, the training, the implementation procedures, the cleanup, the et cetera, et cetera. So there's always something that we could do to effectively fill that extra week of time to absolutely synchronize our out of step sprints to be fully aligned with the releases. And as they say, I think we need to do that for overall sanity for the business to keep them from being overwhelmed. But I think there's lots of good reasons why we want our sprints to be at a step so that we can manage the workload of the sprint retrospectives and the sprint plans. And that concludes this nugget on delivering large projects with Scrum. The answer is, can we deliver large projects with Scrum? Absolutely, we do that by scaling the team. And this is very easy. We just have multiple teams. And we allow our multiple teams to work as a collective group of self-managed teams. And we employ this principle of Scrum of Scrums to keep all of our teams in step and in line and to give good knowledge sharing. So scaling the team, absolutely very easy. We also discussed that scaling the product owner is very hard because the product owner owns the vision and it's very hard for the vision to be shared. So recognizing that we will have to scale the product owner, we will need to have more than one we discussed ways we could do that. We can make more usage of SMEs and get the SMEs more engaged. And we can have very specific roles and responsibilities so that our multiple product owners, it's absolutely clear what the roles and responsibilities of each of the product owners are so that our teams know which product owner to go to appropriately. 
and we discussed scaling the product backlog. And in fact, although we can scale Scrum to deliver large projects, we don't scale the product backlog. There's one and only one. And one of the best ways we have for, for managing the complexity of a large product backlog on a large Scrum project is we use tools automated tools, and we make extensive use of epics to keep the number of stories on our large product backlog manageable and comprehensible. And finally, we discussed the need to synchronize the sprints and releases, recognizing that we have multiple teams. How do the multiple teams keep themselves aligned? From a sprint viewpoint, we're saying not necessary let the teams self-manage their way they want to work on the sprints, but we need to focus and consolidate the various sprints and the teams at the release level. And we want to do that purely, as at least in Steve's humble opinion, for the sanity of the business. So they're not being hit with multiple implementations from multiple teams on virtually a, a, a concurrent ongoing basis. So for the sanity of the business and to ensure that we're delivering predictable value to the business, we need to consolidate to synchronize the releases. But other than that, let the teams manage the backlog. Let the teams be self-organizing and self-directing. Use the scrum of scrums and run the sprints however they see fit. And in conclusion, the most complex aspect of scaling scrum is scaling the product owner. Can be done, but requires dedication and commitment. This concludes our nugget on delivering large projects with Scrum. I hope this module has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.